Hi, my name is Jay Kim, a second year nephrology fellow, and my grand rounds topic was a literature review against sudden cardiac death in the hemodialysis population. Uh, at this this moment, I'd like to I'd like to ask you all to take a moment on this tired Friday morning, look back on your careers and where technology has brought us now. You are all nephrologists and nephropathologists. We try our hardest to save patients' kidneys from failing. And if they do, do we give up? No, we're stubborn nephrologists. We give them new kidneys, shove catheters in their belly or their neck and filter their blood. Our routine order of 160 uh, F-160 with 350, 600 flows is a just a technologic marvel that keeps our patients chronically alive. And my first month as a fellow, I was in the RDU and uh, there was a custodial staff member uh, that came in after hours and genuinely thanking me, uh, not even a first, first, a first week fellow <laughs> saying, because of the RDU, I had a father for 20 years. That's one of my core memories that motivated me during some of my tougher times in fellowship. And from 2005 and 2010, we've gotten even better at keeping patients alive. Uh, and yet there's a plateau between 2010 and 2015, if you notice the red and the gray lines. So what's killing our dialysis patients and what can you tenacious nephrologists do about it? Uh, noting dysrhythmias as our highest cause of mortality, uh, this was the reason I chose this topic. And some factors predisposing uh, hemodialysis patients to dysrhythmias, I just want to quote Dr. Pitchler one day as a comment from the audience on a different grand rounds. He said, what we're doing to people is crazy. We're pulling their entire plasma volume, going from acidosis to alkalosis, hyperkalemia to hypokalemia, clearing uremic osmoles, all in the span of four hours. There's so many things going on during dialysis. Uh, and in the dialysis population static as a whole, even off of dialysis, there's volume overload and electrolyte abnormalities, changes in calcium, acid base, anemia. Uh, they have hypertension or hypotension at baseline. Uh, there's loss of vagal tone from uremia, reduced catabolism of uh, epi, nor epi, uh, autonomic neuropathy from uh, diabetes, uh, RAS activation. Uh, you have... Changes in your myocardium itself, LVH, fibrosis, atrial stretch, scars from prior MIs, and rapid shifts in blood pressure and volume during the dialysis process, shift in electrolytes, coronary ischemia, hypoxia, autonomic activation. There's so much going on, and yeah, it's a lot, uh, but they all converge to one deadly entity, dysrhythmias. So stay with me here. What if we akin dysrhythmias to something like complement disorders? Like what is our echolizumab? What's our silver bullet? Is there an intervention that targets this converging pathology? In the general population, ICD might be the answer. Uh, and allow me to delve briefly into the indications here. It's gonna be important for our review of literature coming up next. Uh, for primary prevention, LVEF of 35% or less 40 days post MI and 90 days post revascularization for NYHA two or three. Uh, that's despite GDMT if we're expecting meaningful survival for greater than one year. A lot of ifs and thens. 30% uh, or less uh, for NYHA one, 40% or less if they've had NSVT or uh, MI or NSVT from an MI or VT. Uh, if they have underlying arrhythmogenic disorders, they might qualify for primary prevention as well. For secondary prevention, uh, prior episode of resuscitated v -fit, uh, v -tac, so they've had an arrest before without a uh, structural or without a reversible cause, spontaneous VT with any structural heart disease, whether it be valvular or uh, structural ch or channelopathies, uh, VTAC or VFib with unexplained syncope. And the, the AHA Society summarizes their recommendation pretty well in this uh, 2017 guideline. And they say that uh, correcting the VTAC or VFib 
may not improve overall mortality and patient selection for ICD implantation should be taken into account. And we have to also weigh uh, the risk of sudden cardiac death from VTAC VFib against mortality from other underlying uh, medical conditions as well, uh, such as ESKD. Uh, and about CKD, uh, all they say is degree of renal insufficiency likely influences survival benefit. And uh, notice, um, notice the same caveat for all these recommendations, saying that uh, survival of greater than one year uh, and emphasizing that this patient selection is the key, even in the general population. Now, I couldn't get past any of the reviewed articles post-2018 without the author giving a notable mention to our very own Dr. Bansell, uh, where she studied 5,877 CKD patients with an LVF of 40% or less in a non-interventional cohort study. Uh, and when adjusted for demographics, comorbidity, cardiovascular medication use, uh, she found no difference uh, in all-cause mortality between CKD patients in the ICD versus non-ICD groups. And this was studied in the primary prevention population. Uh, ICD placement was not significantly associated with improved survival, but was associated with risk of subsequent hospitalization uh, due to heart failure or all-cause uh, all cause hospitalization. Uh, notably, 29 ESKD patients were excluded, and they could not completely exclude residual or unmeasured confounding or selection bias, the sort of things that escapes the ICD-10, like the milieu or clinician gestalt. Uh, and the study recognizes that causality could not be established in this non-intervention methodology. And I felt that the author's conclusions were appropriate for the study design. Uh, now, very dense, busy slides coming up, but I'm going to summarize them all. Uh, you can just listen. And recall with me the heterogenic indications for primary and secondary implantations of an ICD. And compare with me with these studies uh, to what the control population was and what the author concluded. Um, first is a 2005 retrospective study uh, on 460 versus 5,582 ESKD patients who survived a VFib arrest. They found that implanting the IC an ICD was associated with a 42% reduction in death over a total five-year period. And the author was surprised to find that only 8% of the ESKD population received an ICD and that uh, implantation was associated with greater survival. Um, my response to that would be it was retrospective, but the data was pretty impressive. And the author saying that this is an association was a reasonable conclusion. As opposed to this 2014 meta-analysis uh, where they looked at uh, uh, cardiac imp cardiac device placement in the ESKD population with a mix of primary, secondary prevention indications, a mix of CKD and ESKD, and a mix of um, cardiac resynchronization device and ICDs. Uh, and this showed an odds ratio of 2.31 in favor of device placement uh, for a two-year survival. And the author concluded, uh, ICD in patients with ESKD is associated with improved survival. Uh, the use of ICD therapy in these patients is warranted. Uh, my response to that is that's a pretty big claim for a retrospective study. Uh, it was impressive. It's big data. It's a meta-analysis, but it's muddy data. And I don't know how I can apply what they found to my patient in front of me. All right, looking at primary prevention literature review in the ESKD population. In 2010, a registry search of ESKD patients with ICD, uh, so that's without distinction of primary or secondary indication, they just had the ICD, was compared with patients with no ICD, but had an indi uh, indication for primary prevention. 
the author claimed that the presence of an ICD was associated with higher survival. And my hesitancy with that claim is that the reason for the ICD placement in the first place in the uh, intervention group was not stratified. Uh, so it's not well matched to the primary prevention control cohort. Uh, it's also retrospective. Almost as if it was a response, uh, in 2015, a retrospective analysis of dialysis patients with indications for primary ICD uh, that were placed um, and people that have primary indications uh, were compared, 86 to 86 after propensity matching. And they found that there is no significant association between ICD and mortality. And now come 2019, we get the big one, a randomized controlled trial uh, by Jukema et al., uh, where they looked at 188 patients on dialysis with LVE of 35%. Uh, but the trial was stopped per recommendation of the Data and Safety Monitoring Board for futility, because they found that uh, sudden cardiac death occurred in 11 of 97 of the ICD group and eight of the 91 control group. All-cause mortality was 52 in the ICD group and 47 in the control group. And 25 patients had adverse effects related to the ICD implantation itself. Uh, so the author concluded prophylactic ICD therapy did not reduce the rate of sudden cardiac death or all-cause mortality, which remained high. So now we look at 2021, a database search of 40,000 patients. And in this one, everyone had an ICD and they just looked at uh, normal kidney function versus ESKD population, uh, showing that ESKD population had higher complications uh, to which my response was, well, duh, ESKD plus any pathology has higher complications. Um, and some risks of ICD placements that are higher in the ESKD cohort include implantation site hematoma, uh, venous hypertension, especially if the catheter is ipsilateral to the ICD lead, uh, infection, central vein stenosis, and risks that are not associated with ESKD um, of the implantation itself is pneumothorax, lead fracture, lead dislodgement, so is this the last nail in the coffin for ICD in the ESKD population? No, there's another nail in the coffin for patients meeting the general criteria. Uh, let's talk about some quality adjusted life years. Uh, this is a quantification of duration and quality of life relative to a disease or intervention. And it helps apply a numeric value to be able to compare a short life with perfect health uh, you can kind of see here, uh, versus a uh, long life with chronic disease uh, that you can see here. Uh, collies are commonly used in epidemiology and health delivery studies, uh, asking how much value does this intervention add and how much money does it take? So an ICD in the general population adds between one to three collies and costs between 68,000 and 100,000 per collie. And historically, this $50,000 per collie is a common threshold in US cost effectiveness studies. And increasingly, it's some, it seems like uh, inflation is hitting medicine as well, because researchers are referencing a 100,000 per collie threshold. And dialysis itself, it has an average uh, cost of $129,000 per uh, collie with a very wide range uh, in between the extremes of the population. Uh, so overall, I found there's no silver bullet. Um, Dr. Pitchler is right about the process of dialysis on its own and how stressful it is on the body. And not only that, ESKD as a whole is a recipe for mortality. Uh, so what now? Uh, transplant, that helps. See how, the, uh, see how small the teal got here 
uh, compared to the in-center hemodialysis population. And for PD, I was actually surprised to find a similar appearing uh, dysrhythmia section. Uh, so my takeaways here, even in the non-ESKD population, uh, patient, pop patient selection is the key. And the improved mortality data from ICD placement came from either pure secondary prevention or a mixed primary secondary prevention uh, cohort. Improved mortality was never shown in the primary prevention ICD uh, or with the primary prevention control, uh, even in a randomized control trial. Uh, so who am I gonna refer to ICD placement? I'm gonna prefer the young over the old. I'm gonna prefer secondary over primary. Uh, if they have structural heart disease or channelopathies, that might push me over. And if the patient has anticipated higher remaining uh, quality adjusted life years, the best we can do is screen for the patients who would have the highest benefit and ask the question for the proceduralist. So even though secondary prevention might be a promising target, overall, I leave you guys with a null grand rounds topic. I couldn't solve high, I couldn't solve high mortality in our ESKD population like I wanted to. And my takeaway from all this reading is individualized care with our best efforts for our patients is what allows someone to have a father for 20 years. And November is a tough month for everyone listening here, especially for our first years because of kidney week, daylight savings ended, Veterans Day, Thanksgiving, and to all the nephrologists out there who might not have, who might not have been encouraged recently, uh, take a moment to look back at all those quality adjusted life years you've added for the families this Thanksgiving season. That's all from your efforts and I appreciate your time. And I'd like to welcome some questions from the audience or even some insight from Dr. Bansell herself uh, and whether I'm interpreting this data correctly or not. And it looks like I ended early. Thank you, Jay. Um, yes, yeah, several faculty members called out for their scholarship and their commentary. Otherwise, if they want to ask questions, I'll um, defer to them. Hi, um, this is Nisha. Jay, I just wanted to congratulate you on sort of tackling a difficult topic. Um, I thought you did a really nice balanced view of the literature. And as always, thanks for recognizing the work that our group has done. Um, I think this is complicated. I mean, I think you really talked about individualization of care, which is important. I think looking at data sets doesn't really get at the nuances of you know, how tough these decisions are in terms of risk versus benefits for individual patients. Um, you know, what I do want to avoid is a therapeutic nihilism in these patients thinking that nothing works. I don't think that's the case. I think we have to find the right therapies for the right patients. So thank you. Jay, I, I wonder in your, um, in your review, you, you kind of listed the multiple, um, physiologies that are maybe unique to folks on, on dialysis. Did you find any literature trying to kind of understand the you know physiology um so that we might be able to kind of tailor interventions to what's really causing sudden cardiac death in this group yes so i didn't know that i would finish early <laughs> uh and my original plan was to look into all of these factors but the the topic itself got so big that i uh didn't look into them as i had previously wanted to and uh, Nisha, thank you for the addition of that. Uh, the therapeutic nihilism was definitely a topic that a lot of the literature mentioned in our ESKD population. Yeah, you know, in terms of pathophysiology, it's, you know, there's um, some nice summary reviews on this, but, you know, there are very unique risk factors in dialysis patients. Like you mentioned, the dialysis procedure itself is um, cardiovascularly very stressful. You know, we know that there's myocardial stunning and ischemia that happens, particularly with intradialytic hypotension, um, you know, and that's thought to be a fibrotic and proarrhythmogenic trigger. Um, people have looked at, um, you know, differences in electrolyte gradients with dialysis. You know, overall, what we're seeing is sort of 
more physiological treatments, you know, frequent dialysis, slower dialysis uh, could be beneficial for the heart. Um, and there's been some, like the frequent hemodialysis network study showed that there's regression of LVH, which is a risk factor for sudden cardiac death. So, you know, I think, I think we're learning, um, but I think that's part of the reason that ICDs and all these, uh, these other devices don't necessarily work in our patients is that we're not getting at the underlying cause of what's, what's driving this. Sorry, I will stop now. Uh, Justin. Yeah, to, well, I guess I wonder to what Nisha and Jay are both saying, like if, because I assume a lot of these people, most of the people are not on GDMT therapy. Um, and so like, is the lack of signal for potential benefit from ICD somehow connected to people not being on these other medications that will stop the like fibrosis and LVH and da, 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 all stuff. I think some of the challenge, oh, sorry, go ahead, Jay. Oh, no, no, I, my answer was going to be basically, I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, and that's exactly right. You're exactly right in saying you don't know. We don't, the problem with GDMT is that um, much of it has not been studied in dialysis patients. Um, you know, of all the GDMT, you know, cardiovascular therapies, beta blockers are probably the most widely used. Um, even RAS inhibition is pretty variable um, in, in dialysis patients, and we don't have you know, definitive data on SGLT2s um, and other therapies. MRAs, there's actually been quite a few um, trials now on spironolactone, um, and the issue is always the hyperkalemia. Uh, you know, but I think this is a growing area that we need to, we just need more data on how, how GDMT works in dialysis patients and if, it, if we can um, reduce complications. I think I think another one of the concerns, uh, just to piggyback off Nisha's point, is that patients aren't always adherent to their GDMT, and we're part of the problem in that regard. Um, a lot of these medications, beta blockers, RAS inhibition, they lower blood pressure, and intradialytic hypotension is a big concern in dialysis patients as well. Um, so if patients aren't taking their beta blockers before dialysis or their RAS inhibition at all, um, are we going to see the same cardioprotective effect of these medications in dialysis patients? Unclear, but probably not. Yeah, I think the biggest takeaway I got from all of these papers was just patient personalization, individualization uh, in who gets the ICD or who even gets GDMT, uh, like you mentioned, Ben. Um, so, yeah, I, no silver bullet is uh, the, the name of the story here. And then also, I think there was just a uh, randomized trial presented at Kidney Week this past week of uh, spironolactone in dialysis patients specifically, and they found that um, hyperkalemia was more common in the spironolactone arm as compared to the placebo arm, uh, and that spiro did not appear to uh, reduce cardiovascular endpoints, but I don't think it was properly powered. I'm not recalling it perfectly if anyone knows more information about that trial. Yeah, I mean, it was, um, they didn't achieve efficacy for their primary endpoint. There's more AEs, and that's consistent with, um, that was a weird trial. They started recruiting like 15 years ago, and they finished it, so it became non-contemporary. They just took, it was it was out of France. Um, and then there was a U.S.-based trial, SPIN-D, um, which found something similar. But there was actually in spin D, there was a dose related effect for hyperkalemia. So if you, depending on the dose that you use, so moderate doses of spironolactone were better tolerated. Well, thanks Jay for taking on a challenging, challenging topic and um, important questions, if not all the answers. Thank you.